This conference will now be recorded. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the East Orlando Chambers Enable Remote Efficiency and Productivity. So we're really excited to have you guys on today. Um, and this is a great panel. Um, we have Sean Greenberg, uh, Greenbaum, and he is with Microsoft. <laughs> Scott uh, with Darden and Steve, who's with Advent Health. Um, Actually, Sean, I want to start with you because I would like you to um, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your um, your background. But before we get started, I do want to recognize our trustees. We have our Advent Health, uh, Avalon Park Group, Avalon Insurance Services, Duke Energy, Fairwinds Credit Union, Great Florida um, Insurance, Orlando Health, Suburban Land Reserve and the Orlando Law Group. Um, they make it possible for us to put these programs on and we truly appreciate them. So Sean, um, I know you've been with Microsoft for five years now, right? And um, I think part of your role is you do a lot of work from home. So this isn't really anything new for you. Yeah, that's that's correct. And, and thanks for having me, Dorothy. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been with Microsoft for a little over five years now. and um, my entire time with Microsoft is work from home or work from pretty much anywhere they can they can put me. Um, so a large uh, portion of my job is is at home, and uh, a lot of it is also traveling to customer sites. So I'm working from airports, hotels, trains, buses, <laughs> kind of anywhere I can be, really. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so in uh, Scott. Tell us just a little bit about your background. I know you're with Darden. Um, you've kind of been in a few different locations, but uh, you are leading a, a big team over there. And you might have to unmute yourself, Scott. Or we'll go on to Steve while Scott works with that. <laughs> Hey, so my name is Steve Hardy. I'm at Advent Health. I run our uh, information security threat team. Um, so we have a large team that runs our security operations center. We look for um, active issues in the environment. We have kind of a mix. So we're not full time like Sean is at home, um, but we do allow work from home, thankfully. Uh, I think that's kind of essential in our role, being that we kind of work 24 7 in a lot of areas. So similar to Sean, but kind of a mix. Right. So do we have, um, Scott, are you able to tell us a little bit about yourself now? Yeah, if you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes, Yes, sir. All right. So uh, yeah, so I started at uh, Darden Restaurants about five years ago, uh, but I managed the data center team um, over there. So we have our headquarters located in Orlando. Um, we have about 1,800 restaurants that we manage. Um, and the data center is uh, my primary responsibility. So uh, in that, we have uh, a team of 11 people. And as far as working remote goes, uh, we have um, people that work remote every other day, uh, a couple of days a week. So this is uh, not necessarily new for us. Um, what's new for us is the five days a week. So that's definitely something that we are trying to figure out on the fly here. OK, well, perfect. So we have a mix of. Yeah, uh, those that do it all the time and then, you know, occasionally. So, Sean, you know, you've been working ho from home for a while. You've been doing this on a regular basis. So what t tricks and tips would you have for those that are might be new to this? Sure. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely very different working from home, especially permanently um, than it is going into the office. Um, so the, the first few months I was doing this role, I, I had to figure out or reinvent what, what working at the office quote unquote looks like um, to kind of start some some tips and tricks I would I would give to to everyone here is you have to establish some sort of dedicated workspace in your home um, whether that's a spare room or a, an extra bedroom in your home that you can set up as an office or a, a corner of the kitchen table or, or some sort of dedicated workspace um, that's going to be you at the office um, some place that you can leave at the end of your day essentially and not take that work with you. Um, that's that's definitely a critical thing that that a lot of us uh, Microsoft people, but but just people that work from home in general, 
learning curve right there from, from the very beginning. Um, you also kind of need to figure out what your work rhythm really looks like. Um, and when you when you have a, a typical office job, you, know, you go into the office eight o'clock, you hang out for a few hours, you leave at five o'clock. Um, when you're working from home, that doesn't necessarily fit with the way a lot of people wants to work. Um, some people are more productive in the morning, so maybe starting at 7 a.m. or 6.30 in the morning um, works better for them, taking a long lunch in the afternoon and then finishing the afternoon strong. Um, other people are afternoon or evening people, and, and maybe uh, their work allows them to kind of shift their work schedule a little bit. So, so finding that time that, that really works good for you is definitely important. Um, but also you have to get up and walk around from, from time to time. Um, it's a little bit easy in the office because you have distractions of other coworkers coming by to interrupt you or saying, hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee together or you know, the water cooler or, or whatever your office happens to have for amenities. Uh, but you don't have those things at home. You don't have that random distraction of somebody walking up to you and, and interrupting you for a couple of minutes to kind of reset your mind. So you have to do that on your own. Um, so, so either put on your calendar or, or set a timer, or whatever, whatever method works for you. But remember to kind of get up and walk around, leave your office for a few minutes every day or every few hours. Um, that's definitely been something that, that has helped me a tremendous amount. Um, and then another tip that I found for me personally is I, uh, I tend to pace whenever I, I talk. So I can't do that on this particular meeting since we're on camera. Uh, but if we weren't, um, I'd be walking around my house right now with my headset on. So for me, having something like a wireless headset was a game changer for me um, because now I could actually get up and, and walk around the house a little bit while I'm participating in an, an audio uh, conference call or a bridge call or something like this. Uh, and that definitely improved um, my quality of working from home um, just by trying the, those, those few little steps right there. Um, so I mean, yeah, there's probably a whole hour worth of conversation right here, but I don't want to take up too much of uh, our time. Um, so Scott, you mentioned that you kind of manage a team and they work from home sort of intermittently. What are, um, what are some things that you've found with, with managing your team and working from home? How is that different and how, did, how have you really adapted to that? You're muted again. I'm good with IT. <laughs> um, so it's definitely stopped uh, things like drive-bys. So um, being able to swing by a coworker's desk and uh, just talk to him for five minutes um, to iron things out real quick doesn't necessarily happen. Um, I can't walk by and um, you know check to see if uh, somebody's in their cube uh, for a two-minute conversation. Now I've got to send an email or find some other way to communicate with them. And sometimes that, there's that delay. And so part of it has just been adjusting to having a delay um, and being okay with that. So I have 11 people on my team. So trying to reach out and get in touch with everybody I found uh, has changed quite a bit there. Um, so there's some certain things that we've kind of been experimenting with uh, to see what works best to keep us all kind of um, working as a team and kind of heading in the same direction. You know, so things like uh, just one example. So we have a, a daily team meeting. Um, never did that in the past. Uh, we'd, we'd meet up once a month and just kind of go over everything and then, you know, little meetings here and there um, as needed. But now we have a daily meeting uh, to go over everything that everybody's working on because we don't get those. Uh, you don't hear people talking in the office anymore where, you know, two rows over, uh, you can hear somebody saying, hey, yeah, we're doing this. And somebody pops up. Oh, hey, I've got something for that. It doesn't happen. So adjusting to everybody not being in the office has been definitely a, uh, a play on experimentation here, trying to figure out what works best. And we're still going, but um, there's definitely some things that we found that have helped. So um, Steve, you have a team as well. Uh, you've been managing them for a couple of years now. Um, how do you kind of handle that on your side as well? Okay. You know, being in security, it's a little bit different, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we, we kind of do a mix of what both you and Sean said. Um, so we also adopted kind of a morning meeting, like you said, Scott. Um, we, while in the office, all sit within, you know, a pencil throw of each other. So being able to just stand up and say, hey, this is happening. Um, in our role, specifically dealing with security, things can happen very quickly, um, multiple things at a time. So it's nice to be able to just stand up and say, hey, I need you to do this or I need you to do that. Um, so having that morning meeting has helped us. 
having um, a solution where we can all jump on a video call like this and have conversations with each other um, to just kind of talk through what we're going through has, has really changed it. Um, one thing that I've noticed in particular is like you both, uh, or Scott mentioned, not being able to just pop by somebody's cube. I recharge my phone about four times a day now, um, because that's the new cube pop in, uh, apparently is I just get random phone calls throughout the entire day. So I've tried to adopt that and help manage upward as well and downward to my team to say, Hey, you know, let's really block out your calendars. If you're in a meeting. I want to respect that. I don't want to call you. Um, so that's something that we've tried to to manage there. Um, we use, you know, Outlook and Office 365 and Teams. So for us, that shows me if somebody's in a meeting. So I know not to bug them. Um, things like that have have helped us. So. Cool. So, I mean, that's definitely very, very helpful advice for everyone there. Um, so what about, so, so since uh, I guess Scott and Steve, since both of you sort of manage teams, how are you um, kind of keeping tabs on that your team's being productive, that they're actually doing the work from home that you want them to be doing? Yeah, so um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I keep, uh, keep tabs on my team. Um, I have the... Uh, the luck, I guess I would say, of having an outstanding team where I really don't have to worry about that all that much. Um, some of the things that I do, uh, because I do have to keep track of work that we as a team have to meet and we have projects and we have deadlines and uh, we have to make sure that we're meeting those and I have to speak to them on a regular occasion, provide status updates, you name it, right? Um, so some of the things that we do around that are we've never really kept a uh, kind of a task tracker as a team in the past um, and so we've set one up and so if we have a, uh, a task and a deadline now uh, we set up a task for it on a shared uh, planner we're actually using office 365 not to plug microsoft here too much appreciate uh, sean appreciates that i'm sure i'll take the plug that's good <laughs> um but we use a uh, planner um in Office 365, and that allows us to all kind of see what everybody's um, working on at any given time. Uh, we have deadlines built in. If I create one and assign it, I can use some of the automate applications like Flow to automatically notify someone that we've assigned a new task to them. Um, we also have a built-in ticketing system uh, for the enterprise that we use, and so incidents and uh, work orders from other teams can be handled there, and we keep track of that. Um, but a big part of it is those daily meetings. So those daily meetings that we have, we get to go through and uh, kind of keep track of um, getting those daily updates that we used to get in those quick drive-by chats or uh, the meetings that we all attend. Um, so those daily meetings are helping there as well. So keeping track of uh, the deadlines is really what we focus on. Um, and I think that's been a key piece of our, really so far, success with remote work. Um, because I don't care if they're available uh, every second of the day. Um, I don't care if they start the day at 8.30. I don't care if they start the day at 7.30 in the morning. Um, my team works all hours of the day and night. Um, it really just depends on works, what works best for them. Um, what I do care about is that they're getting the work done. And so we track the work. Um, we track to make sure that people are getting the projects done, that tickets are being uh, closed on time. and that's what we care about. And it takes away a lot of the pressure of asking, are people working? Are people actually online at their computer? I don't care. Either they get their work done or they don't. And my team does, so I'll let them do the job. Steve, how about you? Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we kind of work similarly um, in that regard. I mean, we, we do different items, right? So our team isn't project oriented. Um, we are more operational, so I don't get a project. We get a security event or security incident, and we run it to the ground. Um, so that's how we work. We do use ServiceNow for tracking, so we open a, a ticket, right? So that's how we track this is how many incidents, because it's all about, in the end, reporting how much work from that aspect we're doing. Um, it also helps us for budgetary reasons to say either we need this many people or we don't or vice versa. Um, but I, I agree with Scott and I personally don't care if you take a step away and go for a brief walk or throw something in the laundry. 
in the end, we need the work done. And I'm glad to hear that you also have a fantastic team. I, I talk so highly of my team. I love my team. Um, I'm very fortunate for that because there is that relationship where I don't really have to push on people and say, hey, where are you at with this? They're, they're on top of it. They're letting me know. Um, we try to have that communication back and forth. We have a chat that goes 24-7 on the team. So we have a general, hey, what's going on? And then if there's an incident, we open up a separate chat for that. That way we know that's exactly what's being talked about. Um, and then we can go back to our normal chat. Um, everybody's going to kind of be different. I think it's just important to, to figure out that flow with your your team. But from from our aspect, you know, I, I don't want to be a micromanager and say, oh, you know, I, I messaged you and it took you three minutes to get back to me. Like I, that doesn't build a good relationship overall. You know, if you, if you trust your employees, you're going to trust you and do the right thing. And in security, especially I, I need them after five o'clock. So if at 450 they're offline and I have a problem with that, they're not going to be the first team to jump on at 10 PM or 2 AM to help me out. So yeah, just, just having that, that has helped us drastically. Yeah, that, that sounds very, very good. Um, and then on, on my side, as kind of an employee um, working from home, you know, I mean, my manager is in a different state. I've, I've never met my current manager. Um, and my manager has 20 something, 30 something people that report to him all across the country. Um, we have to be capable of working independently and, and meeting project deadlines and, and, and handling customer billables in, in my case. Um, that's that's really how we're tracked is more or less a, a objective or goal based, not so much time based. Um, so, like for example, I'm not a morning person. I uh, I am rarely a productive member of society before 10 or 11 a.m. Um, but I can do amazing things at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Um, so being able to work on my schedule in a way that works for me and still meet my customer deadlines, my other business expectations. Um, is phenomenal uh, from the work from home um, business um, side of things. Um, so that's really how my management tracks what am I doing or how are we doing things is it's, it's not eight to five. It's not, hey, you are online and I sent you a message and you didn't respond in five minutes. Um, it's you have a goal, you have deadlines, you have things you need to accomplish. Did you accomplish those things in the expected amount of time? Um, so um, with that, it definitely, uh, people used to be in the office a lot working face to face. And I remember before Microsoft, I, I too worked in an office and I had cube mates that would do those, those random drive-bys. Um, and not having that is a big change for a lot of people. And, and I'll openly admit that there's a lot of people that try work from home or even try working in a role like, like I'm in, that the work from home doesn't work for them. That's just not their style or their way of doing things. The, the, the adaptation is too large. Um, but there's ways that you can kind of adapt to that and, and kind of, you know, Im imitate what it's like working in an office when you're working from home. So that face-to-face that -face type stuff. Um, so some things that we'll do is we will try to set up things like virtual happy hours um, where we'll have like, you no, know, we're Microsoft. So yeah, we're using Microsoft Teams and then Skype before that. But we'll have a, a Teams meeting kind of set up on the calendar for, you know, my manager's reports. So all, all 20 or 30 of us will have that meeting and, you know, maybe about half of us will join. Um, but it's kind of just unstructured time to have some face time with your, your teammates and your peers. And to just maybe you don't talk about work at all. You just talk about, hey, how's the kids? How's the wife? What do you have for dinner? Sometimes it's, hey, I've got this thing coming up next week. And I'm really stressed about it. and I need some help with it. And somebody else can say, hey, I've, I've got some availability or that's in my skill set. I can help you with that. Um, so, so having those sort of unstructured happy hours is a really good way of making the team still feel like they're a team and you're not just one person sitting alone in your house all day. Um, definitely a very, very important thing to do there. Um, collaboration is still important. Just because you're working from home, you're still not a one person show that has to do everything, right? Um, maybe I can't walk up to your cube and ask you, hey, can you look over this Word document or this, this email I've written? Um, but we can do collaboration and sharing of those documents, and we can co-author um, different documents. And, and it's not just a Microsoft technology that does that. Google has a similar capability, and there's others out there where you can have multiple employees have access to the exact same document and be editing and co-authoring that document simultaneously. Um, so whether it be a Word document or a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint or some other thing that you're working on, um, 
you're still a member of a team, even though you're home and you're remote. Um, so if you have tools or access to tools like that, definitely take advantage of them. And if your company doesn't have those things, ask them <laughs> to get those things. Um, Cause it's, it's definitely going to help you and your teams um, do their job. Um, another adaptation piece for working from home is different time zones. Um, when you're working in an office, you're used to everybody being in the office eight to five and working in the same time zone. But depending on the size of your company, you might now be working with people that are on your team that are not in the same time zone. Um, so be respectful of that, that your working hours may not be somebody else's working hours, um, but also try to take advantage of that too when you need to. So if there's a, a deadline or a project coming up and you know that this needs a lot of work, well, hey, I can give you some time during the day and during my you know, early evening or evening hours, you're on the West Coast, you can take advantage of your time while you're still working to add on to my project and then vice versa. I can start on something before you get up in the morning so that whenever you're on, in the office, you're ready to go or you've already got some things taken care of. Um, so keep that stuff in mind and take advantage of that. Um, and then uh, exactly like what we're doing right here using video, uh, that's also another good way to build rapport with your team. Um, being able to see your team and see how they interact definitely helps get rid of some of the uh, ambiguity of what an instant message or a chat or text might have. Um, you can read a text and maybe think, was that kind of a snarky reply? Was that, you know, what was that person's tone when they typed that message? Um, but if yeah, you can see their face. A very sarcastic personality, Sean, and uh, sometimes that doesn't come across well in, a, in an instant message, so you're definitely right there. <laughs> very true. But if I can see your face and see you kind of grinning while you're writing something or saying something, okay, mm -hmm. I, I might have a little more context there that maybe Scott's not really a jerk and he meant that in a funny way. Maybe. Um, so yeah, <laughs> absolutely right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I feel like we've kind of covered a lot of depth on kind of how to set up your work from home environment. Um, Scott or Steve, do you have anything else to kind of add for, for that before we sort of go on to maybe more techie type things? I don't have a comment on that to add to, but I do want to let everybody know that if you do have questions as we're going, please type them into the chat. Um, we want to make this as interactive as possible and we'll kind of read those and make sure that we, we get to your questions as we go. Um, we just kind of started on the, the basics, work from home, how we handle it, but we will be getting more more technical. And if you have questions from what we just talked about or future, just please make sure that you uh, drop those in for us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah especially as we go into some of these uh, technologies, um, we're kind of, we, we live in this field. And so sometimes we use acronyms without thinking about them. And so if we get to that point and we say, hey, you guys should use something like VPN, um, please you know, throw it out there, hey, what is VPN? You guys are using a whole bunch of technical jargon that doesn't mean any sense to me, so this isn't gonna be helpful. Um, so with that, uh, some of the questions that might be popping up right now are, um, so now everybody's working from home. How do they get access to their stuff? So if you're a small company, maybe you use uh, Google Apps for Business or you use Microsoft Office 365 and everything is remote already. Um, a lot of startups today are all 100% SaaS, that's a software as a service. So that means that all your stuff is hosted in the public cloud and you can get to it from anywhere. But if your business has been around for a little while, um, you typically will have a server or two or more on your business network, right? And uh, your files are typically accessed from you, um, from the office. So you don't really, this makes it hard to work from home. So there are technologies out there that can help you with this. So one of those that I mentioned was VPNs. So this is a virtual private network. Uh, so a lot of your firewalls that you get today that you might plug into your modem um, will have a VPN built in. And so if you have a uh, some sort of VAR or uh, PC support person that can come in and help you set this thing up, you can then have your computer at home connect to your office at, um office network through this VPN, this virtual private network, and you can access your server, your files, just as if you were there sitting in your office chair. Um, so we're seeing a lot of movement like that, right? So there's a lot of people that are trying to transition to these remote technologies, um, even before all of this coronavirus, COVID-19 stuff, um, people are transitioning there because it's easy. It's very simple to manage. 
Um, so if you don't want to think about hosting a file server, you move it to SharePoint or OneDrive or Box or Dropbox or something like that, right? So there's a lot of different technologies out there um, to help people work remotely. And so, well, instead of me going through that, why don't I transition over to Sean? Because um, I know Sean's got a lot of experience here. Microsoft is one of the premier, uh, I guess I would call it remote workforce uh, application owners out there. Uh, so Sean, what do you guys see with 365? Are you guys seeing a big bump? Is it steady? What are you saying? Sure. So I mean, well, so first as, as a, a company, Microsoft, obviously we do have a significant um, remote workforce. Um, I, I couldn't guess the numbers of people that, that primarily work from home within the company, but it's definitely the tens of thousands, if not even higher than that. Um, so we're, we're definitely a very evolved rem, uh, work from home business. Um, but likewise, we also sell products to companies to help them enable remote workers um, to work from home as well. And one of our, our signature products there is a, a product called Office 365. Um, I'm assuming pretty much everyone on the call has at least heard of Office 365 and maybe even some of you are using it already. Um, there's a lot of components there. I'm not gonna get salesy with, with this particular talk, um, but yes, we are noticing, and we've been public about this, uh, we are noticing a big increase in companies adopting Office 365, large and small. Um, just to be the smaller mom and pop shops with you know a couple dozen employees to the, the gigantic Fortune 500, 100 companies um, that have been using Office 365 or are using it increased or have increased their usage of Office 365 since COVID happened. Um, and from our perspective, that's definitely the product that enables a tremendous amount of remote work um, capabilities. Um, from having OneDrive for document storage, for SharePoint, for like team collaboration, um, email in the cloud, uh, and, and probably about a dozen other things that are there in that software suite right there. Um, it's all part of that product. Um, something and, else. And jump in there, jump in yeah. there, Sean. We actually, as a, a way to prepare for this meeting, um, we were trying to figure out kind of what topics we wanted to make sure that we covered. Um, we pulled up Google Drive and we just threw a document up and we just, every, everybody just starts typing, right? So if you're not aware of that as a tool, it is fantastic. Um, you can get it for free. Uh, it's, any of these tools out there that allow you to do this, you, you cannot uh, overestimate how much this working on the same document at the, at the same time can help you collaborate with your coworkers as you're working through stuff. Um, so sorry, Sean, please. No, no, you're, you're good. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I'm the Microsoft guy on the call. So sure, there's a bias and I'll admit that. But there's there's lots of other products that do this also. Um, each of their own pros and cons, right? So I'm, I'm definitely very in favor of using the right tool. And my tool might not be the right one. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but if you don't have any of these, um, if your company can, start looking into some of these different types of, of collaboration software that's out there and find the one that fits your company and definitely start adopting that for, for the work from home or the remote worker scenario. Um, definitely a benefit. Um, something else that we're seeing out in the environment is the increased use of another technology called VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure. Um, and a, a short definition of that is basically, it's a way of presenting somebody a, a Windows interface like, uh, like looking at their computer, but remotely. So your computer may be in the office or really in, in a data center and I'm somewhere else, not at the company, not on the network, and I can access that desktop and therefore access resources within the company, just like I was in the office. Um, so VDI is a generic term, it's not a Microsoft technology, but it's a generic term. There's lots of vendors in the space. Um, that as an, as an industry has definitely jumped significantly. Um, so if you follow the stock market and you're listening to everybody's quarterly releases, you'll hear Cisco talking about this. You'll hear Citrix talking about this. You will hear us talking about it. Um, but there's been a, a big jump in this technology also um, because it's, it's, it's moderately easy, I guess I would say, to implement. There are some infrastructure costs to go ahead and set this up. And all the vendors I mentioned earlier have services to kind of help you do this and build this fairly rapidly for without a whole lot of cost. Um, but it's a very popular technology because it's a, a fairly secure technology also. Um, unlike having your users with laptops and documents out in the field, their machines have nothing and they're connecting back to your data center or a co-location that, that your company may be using 
for, for their infrastructure. And they're accessing all the data that's there without bringing it home or remotely. Um, so it's a very, very secure way of doing this type of work. Um, so Steve, knowing that you're kind of our security guy on the, on the call here, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the security implications of working from home and, and some things that maybe people should be aware of when they start having their staff work from home. I was itching every time you brought up a new topic. <laughs> I figured. Um, no, <laughs> so th those are some great points. Um, Scott mentioned a VPN, right? So the virtual private network. So if I give a user a laptop, um, th there's gonna be different scenarios, right? If I give a user a laptop that's an employee of, of mine at any company, um, they bring it home, they're now on their home network. Um, if I, if I'm a large organization or if I'm not a large organization, I need, I need to keep that in mind. They're now on their network with their Wi-Fi um, that may or may not be configured appropriately. Are they at Starbucks, right? On, on that Wi-Fi, even after, even after we are out of uh, this COVID scenario here, think about where your users are bringing those laptops. Or if you don't provide your users a laptop and they are on their personal laptop, is that okay for you? Um, from the business aspect, you know, we we talked about a lot of topics. So the VPN would allow us to control that device a little more um, as far as the the traffic that's there. Yeah, it gives us access to to our documents internally, but we also, if we owned a security tool, um, would allow us to control that data going through um, from the incident response team, which is what my team does. Right, we need to have that information to be able to see what, what our users are doing and interacting with um, from, you know, if a user clicks on a phishing link, um, we have the technology to block that. Well, if, if we don't have controls over that laptop, yes, Scott, how can I help? <laughs> can you explain what a phishing attempt is? Okay, yeah. Um, thank you for stopping me on that. So when a user receives an email um, that is, uh, kind of trying to trick the user into giving something back to that malicious person. Um, if that is a, a link to a malicious um, document that, it, that tries to take control over the device or is trying to trick the user into providing credentials, right? So it's very easy for me to clone Microsoft.com and send you a link. Yeah, I'm targeting you, Sean. Um, so it's, it's easy for me to clone that website. Um, and if I buy a domain that is very similar to that, Microsoft, but instead of that last O, I put a zero, uh, the average user isn't gonna notice that. And I can buy that domain um, and trick users into that. Right now, I'm picking on Microsoft, but you have to remember your organization. Larger organizations, like we specifically look for those domains that are around us. We look for registrations of those. Um, we sometimes buy them ourselves, so other people don't because of that. But as a smaller organization, which most people are dealing with, do you think of that? Do you think of somebody making an L and I? Would your users notice that? So anyways, with, with that, um, if I you know, presented a fake login page for Microsoft in this scenario, would your users know it? Would, would they be able to detect that? And as the attacker, I'm going to just provide, uh, present you with an error after you log in. I'm just gonna say, oh, we're down for maintenance, but now I've received your credentials because you've provided them to me. Um, so that's that's what phishing is in, in a kind of a nutshell, either getting you to do something um, or provide credentials. But as the security side, we can help prevent that um, from the organization. So if Sean tells me, hey, this this email looks fishy, right? Huh? Um, if he tells me that, I can then block that for all of our remaining users. I can strip that from all other mailboxes before our users even interact with that. So we have you know, close to 100,000 users that we're protecting. So if five users tell us that there's an issue, that, that's awesome. We can go remove it from everybody else. We can block other people from doing that. Um, so that was just kind of the, the point to bringing that up as far as, you know, you need to think on your devices and your information, how are you protecting that? How are you stopping those users at home if if they are are there now? So I kind of rambled a bunch, but I'll kick it back over to Sean. 
Sure. And and so, I mean, you, you brought up fishing, which is a, a very valid point, because even on our side, we're definitely seeing an increase in phishing attempts um, just within our email services and, and, and people trying to hit us, which means they're definitely going after your companies as well uh, and your email systems, whether you're hosting them in Google or you're hosting internal email systems on your own. Um, so absolutely a very valid thing to kind of be aware of. Um, Actually, I read, a, uh, I read an FBI briefing the other day about one of the top attacks being done right now is against small business. And uh, what they're asking for is they'll, like you said, Steve, they'll, they'll buy a domain that looks very similar. Um, they'll find out who the owner is, and they can typically find that stuff on LinkedIn, right? So you find out who the CEO is, you find out who their assistant is. It takes five minutes to, you know, you call the, the main office line, hey, I'm looking for CEO's assistant. Um, what was her name again? What was his name again? Okay, thanks. And then you email that person uh, with your fake domain from, you know, boss at fakedomain.com saying, hey, um, just got a big business deal. Need you to wire $10,000 to this account or the business or the, uh, the deal is going to drop. Stuff like that is, is what I've been hearing a lot of uh, attempts are going through for. Gift cards yeah. are also a popular one. Where like the, the your skip level boss, your VP of whatever is gonna you know email a, a secretary or somebody kind of lower in the the political food chain and say, hey, we're doing some event, we're gonna do some gift giving thing. I need you to buy a thousand fifty dollar Amazon gift cards and send them to this address or send me the the codes off the back of them so we can go ahead and give these things out. And then they go and they do that and the money's gone. It's the the moment that gift card leaves that person's hands, it's gone and there there was no actual employee giveaway or something like that that these gift cards are going to uh the money's gone so that's another very popular social engineering attack um it's it's always happening but it's definitely kind of ramping up right now because you can't just look over your cube and say hey dave did you send me that email about those gift cards dave's at home you're at home you you have some disconnect there um so those are definitely things that are picking up right now yeah and I I, first i want to say i'm so happy that this has transitioned into security but i think that that's that's a point, right? Is that no matter what role we're in, everything is security, right? Um, so Sean mentioned, you know, you can't just pop up and say, hey, Bob, did you see this? Well, keep in mind that maybe if something comes in an email saying, hey, can you wire this? And it is from Sean and me and Sean are both at the same company. If, if it seems odd, pick up the phone and call Sean to know, hey, did you actually need this? Um, and another item that we didn't touch on is we, we've been talking about your computers, but cell phones are computers now and, and attackers know that and everybody has email on their phones as well. So in that same scenario, if I get you to click on a link on your phone, is the user going to input credentials there? Is the user going to do something there? Um, Scott mentioned and, and I did as well, the, the fake domains. Now we've we've seen an increase in, in COVID related domains, right? Hey, here's statistics of COVID. Here are, um, here's how you get your, your uh, reimbursement check or your financial check um, around this. We've seen a, a huge increase in that. And my team deals with a lot of what we call threat feeds, right? So we deal with the community and say, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? We have a couple thousand just related to COVID alone. So it's, it's really increased. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I know we, we've definitely spread ourselves very thin by going across a lot of different topics here today. Um, but I am curious, I haven't seen anybody comment anything in the chat or anything yet. Um, any specific questions or anything for us? I know we've only got about 15 or so minutes left on this particular meeting. Um, so we want to make sure that we have some Q&A time. Um, so yeah, feel free to unmute or type something in the chat here and, and um, we can we can hit that for you. Anybody? So I guess while we're waiting, um, you mentioned uh, mobile phones, Steve, and uh, a lot of these applications are coming with um, mobile device management. So mobile device management is a tool that you can use to uh, provide policies to a, we'll call it an untrusted or a trusted device, depending on how you look at it. Um, but you say, okay, I want email on um, boss's phone. And uh, to do that, I need to use mobile device management through Office 365 or uh, Mobile Iron or AirWatch or something like that. 
Um, and what that does is it allows you to actually push some of these applications down to your users. Um, and so this is this may not be something for small business, and I'm not sure if we have some some larger companies um, present uh, present here. Um, but mobile device management can make a huge deal in how easily your users can find and uh, access the company documents. So if you guys are moving to um, Google Drive, for instance, um, if they had mobile device management installed on their phone, you would be able to just push Google Drive to their phone. Um, they don't have to go to the App Store. They don't have to go to the Play Store. They don't have to go download it. Um, this could be the same thing for um, work applications like Salesforce. You can push the Salesforce application. Um, so mobile device management shouldn't be ruled out either. Um, it's probably not something for you know a two or three person shop, but if you have 10, 15 people, um, that could definitely be something to look at. So we did get a question in the chat. It was, um, do you do touch on a security of documents that are sent back and forth, um, security of opening a Word document or a PDF from a colleague? It seems to be the concern of one of our um, attendees here that uh, concerned about the attachment. I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, I can I can start there. Um, and it's definitely going to pivot over to uh, Steve for sure and probably Sean. Um, so there's, there's kind of two ways to look at that. Uh, there's one that says, uh, when it talks about receiving documents, and the other one would be, I'm sending a document, how do I send it securely? Right. So um, on uh, the different sharing applications, there's different ways that you can share the app, uh, share a document. So um, one way is to provide a link. And this says that anybody with a link can access or edit the document. Uh, that's essentially the same as just emailing it. You never know where it's gonna go, um, people forward it over. Uh, and things like that. It's the least secure method of sharing a document. Um, you can also, uh, they typically have a, a method to require somebody to lock, to sign in, um, and usually it doesn't cost anything. So uh, let's use Box as an example. So box.com, uh, you would share a file with an email address, user at uh, domain.com. That user then has to go create an email address, uh, an account with their email address that you shared it with, right? And then they can go log in, and as long as they use the same email that you shared it with, they'll see the file. That's considered, uh, I guess, the, the most secure way of using some of these uh, collaboration tools to share documents remotely. Um, as for documents coming in, um, that's where you want to make sure that you're that you're expecting the document. So if you don't know that somebody's sending it to you, um, that's really where we start getting into Steve's territory. So. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Steve and let him answer the scary documents coming into the network, do I trust it or not question. You're doing a great job, and I, I was excited to learn. Um, yeah, I mean, it, Scott Scott hit on some great points. Um, I think that with his mention of, you know, sharing out these documents, um, there are solutions, right? So e even if, again, I'm, I'm going to pick on Microsoft just because I like, I like picking on Sean, but with Office 365, right, and OneDrive, I can share out a document. And like Scott said, there's there's an option to say, hey, this link or or what have you. Um, there are security controls within within Office and within other solutions as well. To where, as Scott mentioned, I need this email address. Uh, they're the only ones that can open this. Um, or I can track it and say, you know, this person can can only open it and can't edit it, or I can actually watch where that document is, depending on the services that, that you've agreed to um, within that provider. Uh, but I think just a key piece is just really thinking about, you know, would somebody do this? Yes, there, there's always somebody that would do something. So just plan for those scenarios. We we run what we call tabletops, right? So we completely pick a random random topic of, if this happened, how would we do this? If Scott sends, sent a bunch of uh, credit card numbers, right? He works for, for the restaurant industry. If Scott emailed out a bunch of credit card numbers on accident or on purpose, how would you handle that? Would you be able to detect it? Would you be able to pull it back or, or do anything? Or do you just, hey, we've got to declare a breach now. Um, so, so those are great there. Um, having the incoming, yeah, I mean, just understanding, like Scott said, 
We specifically, anything that comes from outside the company, we throw a little tag on it that says external before anything in the email. So our users have been trained, hey, this is from the outside. So if I had spoofed that domain, um, it, it's gonna kind of be odd to that user. So just little education tips there. Um, if you have a security department, educating your users on who they are, that you have a security department. Um, if you don't, again, certain organizations, uh, Microsoft is one, offer solutions. Um, I hate plugging, Sean. Uh, offer solutions um, yeah, that, that, can, <laughs> that can assist those small businesses, right? So they, they look for um, emails that are questionable. Google does it. If, if you have a Gmail, right, it says, hey, this, this looks kind of weird from what's in the text. It's that same kind of scenario for, for those incoming documents. If you receive something that you are not expecting um, as far as like an attachment, do you really, what's, what's the worth of you opening that? Uh, we, from our security side, have seen a lot of people that instead of sending the malicious link that you would click in the email, they'll send a PDF attachment. And then within the PDF attachment is the link to try to bypass those security filters. Um, so just knowing that those exist and educating your users, I think, is is a huge win. Um, and leveraging the the software and the solutions and their security controls around them, uh, which was the question, you know, how do we how do we protect that document sharing? Uh, and Sean can probably go into more of it, but just restricting those abilities. So what what did I miss there, Sean? Oh uh, no, I mean you you kind of hit all the important points. Um, one other thing I'll kind of add on to there is is a lot of the different. Uh, manufacturers out there, software manufacturers out there, have something in there, which we call ours rights management, and there's various you know, changes of the name, but it roughly means the same thing, that once I've sent a document to somebody, you can put permissions on that document to basically state what they can do with it. Can they print it? Can they copy it to their local thumb drive? Can they forward the email to somebody else? Um, if it's an email or a document that has very sensitive information, you know, HIPAA data, PII data, credit card you know, data, whatever. Um, and you want to make sure that that file can't go outside of where it's allowed to go. You want to have one of those, uh, so some software like, like that rights management that's monitoring and managing that document that can first identify automatically that says, hey, that looks like a credit card number in this, this email or this document. Um, and then it has some sort of rules that say, you know, maybe there is a legit business reason that you need to email a credit card number to somebody else. But I want to make sure that that person can't print the email, forward it to their non-corporate email address, forward it to somebody else within corporate, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So you want to have something like that to really limit that it can go where it needs to go, but it can't go any further than that. So if you encrypt that document, would that serve as a security? Not really. So, so what encryption does, and encryption is great of an email, but what it does is it protects that message while it's in transit. So whenever I'm sending it from me to Steve, the document's encrypted. So if Scott was in the network and was doing something malicious in our network, and he sees that email go across from one server to the next or across the network, the information's encrypted and mathematically extremely difficult for him to break. But once Steve receives that email, he has to be able to decrypt it so he can read the email and do something with the message. From that point on, Steve could print it or forward it to somebody else and not use encryption at that point. Um, so the, those encryption is part of the security of that story, but it's not the whole story. Yeah, and most... Okay. most Go ahead. I was just going to say, mo most email today now is is encrypted in, in transit, right? So what, what Sean was mentioning there. Um, but a, a key point there around email is, keep in mind that email is one of the most... Uh, sought after from the attacker perspective, getting control of your email. Uh, that's for your organization and personal. So one of my goals as an attacker is to get your email because if I need to reset a password to anywhere else, if I go to Facebook and say, forgot my password, where is that sending it? It's sending it to your email. Um, so another thing that you need to be aware of is not leveraging the same password for everything. So password reuse is what what that's referred to as. And we we constantly see and see have seen an increase, especially now, um, with what's called credential stuffing. So what that is, is when when a breach happens from any site that, that you've ever signed up for, um, if you use the password kitten1 
uh, for your login. Um, if I'm using that same password across Facebook and Gmail and everything like that, what attackers do for credential stuffing is they take that email address and password and try all of these services and see where they can get in. And it, it's extremely lucrative for them. They, they get in all the time. Um, so keep that in mind is that you want your, your password for your, your email, uh, one of your most uh, secure passwords if possible, but definitely not, not reusing passwords. And I know that's difficult um, for a lot of people. I have you know hundreds of passwords, uh, but to solve that, you can look into something like a, a password manager. Um, and that is just a solution that I remember one strong password or two strong passwords, right? My email and my password manager. Um, and then this manages those passwords. When I go to facebook.com, it will say, hey, here's your random password that we generated for you and log in. I don't know the password. It's not the same password anywhere else. And it can be 43 characters long or whatever the website accepts. Um, so if you haven't looked at password managers, that's something that you you should consider. Um, there's a slight learning curve um, for personal and even organizations can can leverage those as well. So there are organizational uh, password managers too. But I'll get off that yeah. soapbox for now. Well, and it's I think it's an important soapbox because it's so easy to compromise somebody that uses reuses passwords. If you can get somebody's password one time for their email, all you got to do is search um, their mailbox for anything with the word account, right? And then you just go reset their password. They're done. Um, you mentioned a password manager. I could not live without a password manager. Um, I use LastPass. So anybody that's looking for an actual, you know, piece of software that you can walk away with um, is LastPass. They have a free version um, as well as a paid version that you can use to share with your family. Um, they have a company version as well. So you could have a, a repository where you can set up um, people within your company to do this and there's a bunch of companies out there. I don't want to just throw out LastPass, um, uh, but definitely look it up. You can have 15 character passwords for every single site that you connect to. Um, and like Steve said, I have two complex passwords that I memorize: my email and my LastPass. Both of them have multi-factor authentication, um, which set, makes that even more difficult to get into, right? So if you can, if you have multi-factor on something, it requires something like a, a text message response. Um, uh, Google Authenticator is in there. Uh, well, John, there's Microsoft Authenticator as well. Um, but yeah, LastPass is a, it, anybody that works on a laptop all day long with a whole bunch of uh, websites and everything, you need LastPass or what a one ePass or whatever the other applications are out there. Yeah, so there's there are a few. Um, thanks for that, Scott. There there is LastPass, which is great. And what is good about it is it's not just on my computer, right? So it syncs to their cloud. Um, and I will say that it is quite secure from the security aspect. They don't they don't have access to your password or your passwords within it. So if I forget that master password and call them up and say, hey, can you help me get in? No, they can't. Um, so that is the one downfall, is whatever password that you create to get in, write it down and put it in a safe or something, uh, or just memorize it. Um, mm -hmm. But they they won't be able to help you, and that's part of the reason is, is to be secure. If they don't know it, nobody else can break into it, or it's less likely. Um, but LastPass is a great one. It syncs with your phone. Uh, which is really nice. So if I'm working on my computer and go to a site, I can have it log in from there. If you have an iPhone or Android, you can actually set up a fingerprint for your password. So when you go to a website or load an application, you can tie it in and it'll say, hey, I recognize this. Do you want to use a password? Well, if a child or somebody stole my phone, um, I don't want them just having access. So I can tie that to my fingerprint or a pin or whatever to protect that there. Uh, so it doesn't just automatically pass through. But LastPass, Dashlane, uh, OnePass, these are all great solutions mm -hmm. and they're, they're gonna have pros and cons for, for everybody. So you need to find what, what fits you best. Um, but I think that the, the primary takeaway from this specific topic is you know, definitely have strong passwords. It is, it is better to have a longer passphrase than a password of random characters that's eight characters long, right? Uh, so part of our role is, you know, understanding how to hack so that we can prevent hacks. 
Uh, so myself and team go through many, many challenges and certifications. We, we know how to do all this. If you have an eight character password, it does not take long at all for us to, to get into that. Um, so having a password of uppercase Y, four, three, pound, like things like that, that's confusing for you to remember and that's difficult. Um, so then that's why you see your users write things down. I'd much rather have a full sentence, uh, 24 characters, 36 characters, what have you, make it a sentence and still have those requirements of an uppercase, lowercase and, and special symbol, right? So the apple pie was delicious today, exclamation point. That is way more secure and gonna take me as an attacker a lot longer. It, it won't, I won't use that method of cracking your password to get in. Uh, it's a waste of my time, but, but yeah, just keep those things in mind. So let me, um, we had one more question come through. It said the evolution of the open floor working environment. Uh, what does the future hold for this? Yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting one. Um, so I, I read an article literally about this maybe like two days ago. Um, I mean, uh, the honest truth is we don't know. We have no idea what, what the future is going to hold in this space. Um, there were already companies that were already kind of starting to jump ship on the, the open floor office plan um, for their own reasons anyway. Um, with all of the social distancing and everything in effect, I honestly hope that this becomes a much more work from home friendly environment. Um, I have no idea if that's going to happen or not, but I hope it does. And, and then maybe the open floor concept won't necessarily be a new hot topic or the, the new thing that companies are doing. Yeah, I can, uh, I can, I can, I lived on both sides of that. So I came from a company that had an open floor plan and, um, I left that company and went to Darden and we each have, you know, our own big cubicle. It's nice. Yeah. So okay. I, I've, I've got my own cubicle. It's that. very nice too. <laughs> So door and everything. I, I do want to be respectful of everybody's time today uh, because it is three o'clock or 301. Thank you guys so much. This is extremely helpful. We really appreciate it. Lots of information. If you have any additional questions, you can certainly put them in the chat and we'll make sure we get them to them and respond. Um, just to let you know, um, coming up with the East Orlando Chamber, we've got cooking with cap. We are going to be doing a um, cooking with one of our chefs at five o'clock on May 6th. Um, on the 8th of May, we are going to be talking with Joey Genovese about looking your best in your pajama pants while you're video conferencing. I wanna know how many of you guys are wearing shorts. And then, okay. And then on May 20th, um, we do have Ron Benzieb. If you're not familiar with him, he does rapid deployable shelters and he's gonna be coming in and speaking with us on one of our chapter. Um, uh, the question is, is, is that a possibility for some of our affordable housing options? So thank you so much for attending today. Thank you, gentlemen, for being so helpful with us. And uh, check the calendar for other events. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having us.